They will demonstrate power. They will show love. And as they do these things, as they represent Christ, what will happen? People won't be able to, to stay away. People will come to them and say, oh, where is this power from? How are these people healed? How do you possess such love for those who are sick? How is, is this Jesus? Show me Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. And these Christians will stand up and that's what they'll do. They'll proclaim truth. In a world of lies, in a world of confusion, they'll proclaim the truth, the way, the life. They will proclaim God's word, which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. They will proclaim the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. They will proclaim the truth of the King of Kings that is light in a dark world. I've entitled our sermon, Bad Maths. Bad Maths. Um, I, I hate maths, always have done, always will. But I do have a good reason to hate maths. Uh, and that is because I've got something which is called, called, called dis, discal, dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia, but with maths. But I do have dyslexia also, which I think means I've hit the home run because I've got dyscalculia, dyslexia, and a speech Im impediment, which means I can't read, write, count, or speak. So, and I'm not sure if you should laugh at that, but I also like how before I said it, the Lord helped me by not allowing me to speak very well and stammer on all those words. But I think I've hit the home run, and the Lord has blessed me a lot that I am very weak, and his power can be made perfect in that weakness. But I do hate maths. And because I hate maths, I've seen a lot of bad sums. And this week, I was looking at Luke chapter 6, and, and I thought to myself, hang on a minute. Has God made a bad sum in this passage? Because something just doesn't add up. Because what we see in this passage is an extraordinary God plus an extraordinary purpose equals God using ordinary people. Now that just doesn't add up. Extraordinary plus extraordinary equals him using ordinary. That just didn't seem right. Or does it? Well, we're going to break that down this morning. Extraordinary God, extraordinary purpose, and ordinary people. And by the end of it, we're going to find out if actually this is bad maths. Last week, we were in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, and we saw Jesus uh, praying through the whole night, praying for strength and for help. And then we come to him now in Luke chapter 6, verse 13, and he rises. It's morning. He's received the strength and the help that he needs. And now he's ready to appoint his apostles. And so in Luke 6, verse 13, which we just heard read, it says this. And when, and when morning came, Jesus called his disciples and chose. Stop there. Jesus chose. Now we are told in Colossians 1 that Jesus is the, the visible image of the invisible God. Which means that in Jesus we see what and who God is like. And in this story, we see, and it is illuminated to us through Jesus choosing the fact that God is a choosing God. Amen. God is a choosing God. He's not a passive God. He doesn't sit back just to wait and see what happens in your life, what happens in this world. No, no, no. He's an active God. God chose when the world would be created and how. God chose when to send his son Jesus to die for you. God is not a passive God. He's an active God. He's a choosing God. You were not made by accident. And if you are a Christian, you were not saved by accident. You're not sat in that seat by accident. You're not breathing that breath right now by accident. God is a choosing God. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says it like this, that God chose us before the foundation 
of the world so that we may be blameless and holy in Christ. Which means this. Before this book even begins, before the first page, before Genesis chapter 1, before there were stars in the sky and drops in the ocean, God chose you. It means this, that before you had the cognitive ability to even have knowledge of the concept of God, God knew you. God chose you before time began. Remember, God can do that because God is outside of time. God isn't bound by hours and minutes and months like we are. God is outside of it. God created hours and months and weeks. God created time. He's outside of time. And outside of time, before past, before present, before future, God knew and God chose you. Which means this. And don't miss this. Don't miss this. This, is, well, this will change your life. Before you even thought of creating the vilest sin and committing the vilest sin that you have ever done. Before you even made that stupid mistake. Before you experienced that horrific trauma and that heartbreaking hurt. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, before a hair even grew on your head. God knew you. With the full knowledge of your most crippling anxieties and breaking fears, God chose you. Hallelujah. That's incredible. That is good news. That's good news. That God, that God, or before time, with the full knowledge of your past, present, and future, knowing everything which you do say and not do and not say, he then looked down at you and said, I want you in my family. So much so that I'll send my own son to die for you. That's good news. We're filled in a world of bad news, 24 hours of bad news, TV channel after TV channel, and yet we can come to church, we can open the book, we can look to Jesus, and we can know that we're a people of good news. Friend, that is good news this morning that God chose us. And yet, however excited I get, I know that there's someone in this room who's thinking, oh, Pastor Will, that is great. I do hope that someone is really encouraged by that. I know, I know that it says that God chose me But God made a mistake in choosing you. No, Pastor Will, don't. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know the things I've thought. You don't know the ways I've failed him. You don't know the things I've seen. No, no, you don't know. But trust me, if you did, you would agree that God's made a mistake with my life. That is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because God can't make mistakes. It's impossible for God to make mistakes. God is totally perfect. He's holy, holy. God is always right. Right and wrong is defined by God. And God is never wrong. He's always right. And God chose you. And that choice was not a mistake. He knew you and what your future would in, entail. And that choice was not a mistake. God knew what, or what you would do and what you wouldn't. And that choice was not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. We see that even here in our story. Jesus chooses and he chooses 12 apostles. And one of them is Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Jesus chose him. And we read in John chapter 6 that Jesus chose Judas knowing who he would be and what he would do from the very beginning. 
Jesus chose Judas knowing he would betray him. Well, then why did he choose him? Because it was his plan. It was his plan. He would fulfill his plans through that choice and through those actions of Judas. It was his plan. Now, I don't tell you that part of our passage. I don't highlight Judas because I think anyone in you is like him. I don't. I highlight that part of our passage to highlight how extraordinary our God is, that he doesn't make mistakes, and he hasn't done in choosing. You know, I know every single person sat in these seats has a story about not being chosen for something and how that has made you feel without value and without worth. Stories may range from not being picked for a sports team. They may range from having a parent who left home and didn't come back. They may range from not getting a promotion that you believe that you should have. They may range from a spouse cheating on you and leaving. Every single person sat in these seats and stood up here on this stage has a story about not being chosen and how that made them feel without worth and without value. And those stories are real. That hurt is real. But let me tell you what isn't real. That lie you have been told and that you are telling yourself that you are without value and without worth. Before the stars were in the sky, before the ocean drops were in the sea, God looked down on you and said, I'll send my son. How could we ever think we don't have value and worth? You've got more worth than you could fathom, more value than you could ask or imagine. You are eternally and forever unbreakingly loved by the God of love. That is good news. God doesn't make mistakes. Your life isn't a mistake. Your work isn't a mistake. Your career isn't a mistake. Your marriage isn't a mistake. Your children aren't a mistake. You being sat in this church right now isn't a mistake. God chose you. And that means God loves you. And that means that God wants you. And he still wants you. Whether you're 20 or 80, God still wants you. And God still has a purpose for you and a plan for you. And that's good news too, because... So that's good news because there is no retirement plan for the righteous. Amen? Some of you older folk are like, oh, don't say that, Pastor. No, there's not. There's no retirement plan for the righteous. But some of you older folk, if we, if we would just humble ourselves and if we would just look up and if we would just trust and obey, then God will continue to open up paths for you, continue to open up entranceways for you, taking you taking you into greater purpose and greater plans and greater influence and greater usefulness for him than you could ever ask or imagine. It's not over for you yet. Far from it. He's got you for eternity and he will bless you and use you for eternity, however gray and wise that you are. Our God is an extraordinary God. And this God, this extraordinary God is Jesus. And Jesus, from the hundreds of those who are following him by this time, chooses 12 apostles. What does that mean? What is an apostle? An apostle translates as a messenger, one who is sent. One who is sent. And so an apostle's role was to get sent out to the to the far-flung corners of the world and take the message of their master to represent the one who sent them. And in ancient times, every messenger knew that this was their role, uh, that to whoever they met, to wherever they were sent, they needed to represent their master, which meant that they needed to look like him, they needed to speak like him, they needed to act like him, they needed the people who they met to see clearly who sent them. Where are they from? Who do they represent? 
And this was no or different to the messengers of Jesus. No different for the apostles of Jesus. They were sent out to the far-flung corners of the earth to represent Christ, to show Christ. Now, we do need to, to be careful just, just a little bit. I can't spend a long time on this. But we do need to be careful and just recognize that these 12 uh, apostles did have a very unique role in the history of God's work that their role had a particular role uh, to write down his, his words and to build the foundation of the church. And so they had a particular unique role. But their overall general purpose, as those who were sent out to represent Christ, was not unique to them, but is the same purpose for everyone who comes as a brick to build upon the foundation of the church which they have laid, which means every Christian has this same purpose to represent and show Christ. Which made me think this week, how? How did they do that? Because the apostles aren't being sent out just to represent anybody. Not any kind of rich Lord and King, and they could just change the clothes which they wear, change how they speak and sound really upper class and posh, or they couldn't just change the way they talk and the way that they look to show people this Lord and this, and this King from on earth. No, 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 no. They're not just representing anybody. They're representing Jesus Christ. How on earth can they show people who've not yet met Jesus who Jesus is. How do we do that? Well, Jesus, Jesus knew that they would need to know how to fulfill this extraordinary purpose that they have to represent Christ to the whole world. And he does what every great teacher does. He shows them. He shows them. Jesus Christ comes down from the high place and the first thing he does with his newly appointed apostles is shows them how they will go about and do their work, how they will live their lives. And he shows them that they will fulfill their purpose in three ways. By, by, by demonstrating power, showing love, and proclaiming truth by demonstrating power, showing love, and proclaiming truth. Turn to somebody and say, power, love, truth. Power, love, truth. Jesus shows them this rather than just telling them this. So let's have a look in verse 17. And Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his followers and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him for power came out from him and healed them all. Jesus he demonstrates power by casting out evil spirits. Jesus shows love by looking at the sick and compassionately heals them. And Jesus proclaims truth because the people come to hear him and he teaches them. He doesn't just teach them my truth and your truth and that lie and their lie. He teaches them the truth, his truth, the only truth. And what's the result? People come to Jesus crowding around him, seeking him, reaching out for him, wanting more. Power, love, and truth. Jesus showed his apostles that this is the way that you will fulfill your purpose. This is how you'll show the world who I am. Power, love, and truth. 
as Christians. They'll be sent out by Jesus and they will come up against spiritual opposition. Satan and his evil spirits will attack them, tempt them, try to break them down and bring them down, hinder them and obstruct their lives and their work. And, and, as, they, and as they travel, these Christians will come across people who have been oppressed and possessed and have been broken down and influenced and have been afflicted by Satan and his evil spirit. But these Christians will not have to fear because they represent Jesus. And so they will be able to call on God in the name of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, they will be able to cast out evil spirits and see people set free. They will be able to resist the enemy and he will flee. They will be able to demonstrate power. And as they continue on their travels from town to town and nation to nation, they will come across people who are sick, injured, hurting inside and out, but they will not need to feel helpless when they see them. No, instead they can feel loved and they can compassionately call on God, pray for these people in the name of Jesus and empowered with the Holy Spirit, pray for them and they will see the lame walk, the blind see and the dead rise. They will demonstrate power. They will show love. And as they do these things, as they represent Christ, what will happen? People won't be able to, to stay away. People will come to them and say, oh, where is this power from? How are these people healed? How do you possess such love for those who are sick? How is, is this Jesus? Show me Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. And these Christians will stand up and that's what they'll do. They'll proclaim truth. In a world of lies, in a world of confusion, they'll proclaim the truth, the way, the life. They will proclaim God's word, which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. They will proclaim the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. They will proclaim the truth of the King of Kings that is light in a dark world. That is how they will represent Christ. That's how they'll do it. And that's exactly what happened. Shortly after this morning, in Luke chapter 6, after Jesus had shown them what to do, we then come to Luke chapter 9. And Jesus sends them out to do what he showed them to do. It says this in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, and Jesus called the 12 and gave them power and authority over all evil spirits and to cure sicknesses. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He didn't just show them the stuff. He empowered them to do the stuff. He didn't just show them how to represent Christ. He empowered them to go out and represent Christ through the demonstration of power, through the showing of love, and the proclamation of truth. Isn't that incredible? I think that's incredible. Before some of you cynics start, well, hang on, Pastor. That was a special time in history. Only the apostles experienced that sort of thing. Only the apostles experienced power, love, and truth. Before you cynics start saying that, you're wrong. Because we then come to Luke 11, and Jesus sends out 72 non-apostles to go out and to demonstrate power, show love, and proclaim truth. And then we come to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you've got the church, all believers. And Jesus ascends up to heaven. They wait, they pray, and then Jesus sends the Holy Spirit upon them, and they receive power. And then they go out.
And they demonstrate power. They show love. They proclaim truth. And do you want to know what happens? The whole world gets turned upside down. This isn't just... This isn't just a promise, an extraordinary purpose for 12 apostles. This is an extraordinary purpose for 72 non-apostles, for the, for the whole church. That the lame will walk, the sick will be healed, the blind will see, and demons will be cast out, and the dead will rise. Oh, friends, it started with 12, and then it went wider, and then it went faster, and now it's with you. Now it's with me. It's in black and white. This is God's word. And it's always been God's plan for us. Always. It says so in Mark chapter 16, verse 16 to 18. Now, whatever you think of Mark 6, 6, 16, there is some uh, critical discussion around. I think that this passage is a good summary of what Jesus has sent us out to do. And Mark says this, and he called, oh, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Are you ready? In my name, because we represent him, we're sent out by him, we're going in his name. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick. They will recover. God is sovereign over all things. God is in control of when you live and when you die. God is in control of when you're sick and when you're healthy. And God is in control of when evil spirits are cast out and when the sick are healed and when the truth is proclaimed, when people believe and are baptized. God is in control, and you go in his name. In his power. Whew! That's good news. That's good news. That's a hallelujah moment, church. Because it's true. And it's real. That's a church on fire. Isn't it? Actually, it's just the church. It just says all believers. It's just the, this is what the church should be like. This is what the church should be experiencing. The church should always be on fire. And a church on fire never needs to start up evangelistic crusades. It never needs to think of a new man-made program to bring people into the church to sit on the seats. Church on fire never needs to do those sort of things because you never need to advertise a fire. From miles away, you can see a fire. From far away, you can smell a fire. And as you get a little bit closer, your skin and bones can feel a fire. People are touched. People are transformed. People are moved by a fire. People can't stay away from a fire. This is a church on fire. And I don't know about you, but I've got no intention of our church being like every other church. I've got no intention of our church not being heard of in our town. I've got no intention of our church having no impact on people's lives. I've got no intention of our church just trying to keep alive and stick to the status quo and not rock any boats. No. No, I've got full intention to rock boats. I've got full intention to be a church on fire. I've got full intention, not just to rock boats, but to rock a nation. Why not? Doesn't our nation need or to be rocked? Parliament openly lies, and people just follow along with it. The church of England have just recently this week compromised on the truth of the word regarding same-sex relationships. We, we are, we're having churches around the nation emptied and churches around 
the nation closing week by week. We live, and this is statistically true, we live in the most depressed and anxious generation in history. Another statistic which is absolutely true, that abortion is the biggest cause of death in our country. Oh, friends, this nation needs to be rocked. This nation is lacking hope, lacking joy, lacking power, love, and truth. It's lacking Christ. This nation needs to be rocked. The churches need to be rocked. Our cry, and if I can, if I can just be, we, our cry needs to be, Lord, revive your people again. Lord, rend the heavens and come down. I don't want to. I don't want to look back at the history books a hundred years from now. And when they speak about this age of the church, them to say, oh, this was the age when the church was asleep. This was the age when more people went to hell than in any other generation. Our generation is responsible for the eternity, for the hearing of the truth and the demonstration of the power and the showing of the, of the love that this generation experiences. And that's a fact. Church, I'm tired. No, I am. I'm really tired. I'm tired of reading biographies and church history books about people who experienced extraordinary things of God. I'm tired, even, in a sense of reading Acts. I'm tired of reading the book of Acts. And I'll tell you why, because I'm tired of getting excited at reading the book of Acts, but not experiencing the book of Acts. I'm exhausted of it. Exhausted of it. Some of you are, are thinking, well, 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 pastor, we speak about these things, but why aren't we experiencing them? Why aren't we seeing more miracles, more power, love, and truth? I'll tell you, because we're still sat in these chairs. These apostles didn't experience power, love, and truth when they were still sat watching Jesus do power, love, and truth. These apostles experienced it when they went out, when they would go. Went out into their workplace, went out to their children, went out into the town, went out into the nations and demonstrated and showed and proclaimed Church, if we want to be a church on fire, then we need to get up and go. We need to get up and do. We need to cry out. We need to pray. We need to take it seriously. Now, this is when we start to find out if this maths is bad or not. Because by this moment, some of you might be thinking, well, whew, if... Uh, if the apostles experienced those things, if those apostles turned the whole world upside down, then they must have been some extraordinary people. Oh, they must have been some supermen. They must have been incredibly intelligent and charismatic and talented and strong and bold and brave. They must have been amazing. But they weren't. No, they weren't. And this is where, for me, the sum just doesn't add up. An extraordinary God who has this extraordinary purpose equals him choosing to use ordinary people. And they are ordinary. Just, just look at this ragtag bunch of 12 men. First of all, we have Simon. And Simon, for his occupation, he used to catch fish. It was a well-paid job in those days, but it wasn't anything spectacular. And then... Jesus renamed him as Peter, which means rock. Now, Jesus didn't name him that because of who he was. He named him that because of who he would become, because he wasn't a rock. 
we spend time with Simon for three years while he's walking with our Lord, and he's not a rock. He's changing constantly. One minute he trusts Jesus, another minute he doesn't trust Jesus. One minute he's fiercely loyal to Jesus, another minute he is denying Jesus to a teenage servant girl. He was changing like the weather. The Simon we find is insecure. He's a little bit arrogant. He's anxious. But that's not who he'll always be. Because then, at Pentecost, after Jesus has ascended up into heaven, he then sends his Holy Spirit. And Peter receives the Holy Spirit and is clothed in power. And fearful Peter becomes bold and brave and stands up in front of tens of thousands and proclaims the truth, demonstrates power, and shows love. And then you've got Andrew, who's the brother of Peter. Again, he caught fish as his job, and he also led Peter to Jesus. Other than that, we don't know anything about him. Then you've got James and John, who Jesus nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, which wasn't uh, a positive name. He called them the Sons of Thunder because they had incredible problems with their anger. Incredible problems with their anger. But then later on, after they received the Holy Spirit and were clothed in power, they became known as the Apostles of Prayer and the Apostles of Love. James, known as the Apostle of Prayer because... James was the first apostle to be executed for his faith in Christ. And history tells us that he was found with his knees calloused and hardened over because he spent so many hours in kneeling to the Lord in prayer. James uh, was the last apostle to pass away. And James wrote some incredible and deep and holy things about the person and the work of Christ and about who we are and about the future that we will experience. And he knew, utterly assured, that he was beloved of Christ. The sons of thunder became the sons of the sun. And then you got Philip. Philip, who was a natural evangelist. He led Nathaniel to Christ. But Philip, he often struggled to understand what Christ was teaching and what he was showing. But what I do like about Philip, which all of us can learn from, is that when he struggled to understand, he always asked. He always asked what that meant and what was happening. But there was also a moment in John chapter 6 where Philip quite publicly and obviously forgot how powerful Jesus was. Again, quite an ordinary man. And then you've got Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, who Jesus recognizes as an incredibly honest man. Other than that, we know nothing about him. And then Matthew, who we do know about. So we heard about him in Luke chapter 5 a few months ago, and he would collect taxes from the Jews while being a Jew himself, which meant he was viewed as a traitor to Israel because he supported the Roman occupying empire. It also meant he was very rich. But then Matthew heard the call of Jesus and he left it all and he followed Christ. And again was used to write some incredible things about Jesus. And then Thomas, famous Thomas, who doubted famously if Jesus had risen from the dead or not. To go along with this mindset, it seemed that Thomas would have quite a negative view of things. At, at first, he would always see everything through quite a negative lens, quite a pessimistic lens. And also, Thomas was very anxious. He would regularly worry about losing Jesus. But also, Thomas had incredible moments of devotion to Christ, publicly declaring him as Lord and God. Again, very ordinary, isn't it? And then you've got James, also known as James the Smaller who was faithful to the end. Otherwise, we don't know anything about him. And then Simon, the zealot. A zealot was a resistance fighter against the Roman occupying army. He hated tax collectors and Romans. And now, 
He's eating with tax collectors and seeing Jesus heal Romans. Judas, not the famous one, another one. Judas is next, and he was passionate about Jesus, passionate about everyone seeing and knowing Jesus. The problem was Judas would often try to do those things in ways Jesus didn't approve. And then lastly, Judas Iscariot, the famous Judas, the Judas, who unlike other people who didn't agree with Jesus and then left, Judas didn't agree with Jesus and stayed and pretended to be a faithful follower of Christ. He stole money from Jesus. He rebuked those who worshipped Christ passionately. He was selfish. He was greedy. He was a hypocrite. And Judas would then sell Jesus to his enemies for 30 pieces of silver, betraying him for Jesus' execution. That's not an extraordinary group of people, is it? There's no supermen in that group, are there? There's good and there's bad. There's ups and there's downs. There's wrongs and there's rights. That is an ordinary group of people. They're short, they're tall, they're fat, they're thin, they're smart, they're stupid. And I find that encouraging. I find that so encouraging. I find that personally encouraging at what God can do through ordinary people. I find that personally encouraging that God can take a dyscalculic, dyslexic, stammering man and make him into a preacher with a master's in theology. That's ridiculous. And God does it. I find that encouraging that God can take a traumatized, broken, hurting, sinful young man and redeem him into a child of God. I find that encouraging this morning. That's good news. And what the extraordinary God can do with ordinary people like me and you. That's good news. And so does this maths add up? Well, I didn't think it did, but now I've realized it does. God doesn't do bad maths. God does good maths. Because what we have here is not just ordinary people. No, I missed something out on my sum. So the sum is an extraordinary God, plus him having an extraordinary purpose, equals him using ordinary people who trust in and are filled with an extraordinary God. The reason the sum works is because these ordinary people are not alone. Peter trusted in the promise of the Holy Spirit would come. He received the Holy Spirit. He turned the world upside down. My friends, this is not bad maths. This is good maths. This is good maths. But the fact is, God does use ordinary people. He loves to use broken people. He loves to use sinners to glorify his name, not in their own strength, but through his not through trusting in themselves, but through trusting in him. We do not trust in horses and chariots and swords and spears, but we trust in the name of Jehovah. Amen. And so friends, this is good, Matt. This is good news. How do you respond? You respond like this. In three ways. Surrender, faith, and a prayer. Okay? You need to surrender. The problem with many of us is that we are the amputees in the Lord's army. God doesn't want any amputees in his army. He wants your arms and your legs. He wants your heart and your brain. He wants your past, your present, and your future. He wants your fears and your secrets. He wants every room in your house, and he wants every minute of your life. God doesn't want any amputees in his army. So we need to fully surrender to God, repenting to him of where we've held back, running back to him when we've run away and saying, God, no more. I come to you. Take everything. And then next, we need to have faith. We need to trust. We need to trust that God is with us wherever we go. That would change the world. That would change the church if we trusted when we go into work and tell people about Jesus that Jesus is with us. That when we pray for people to be healed, the Spirit is with us. We need to trust and step out. Step out in that trust and go. And then lastly, we need to pray. Pray to receive more of God. Pray to receive the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Spirit if you've not yet been baptized, to be filled with the Spirit if you need more of Him to be filled in you. 
We need more of God. So will you respond to this call this morning? Will you respond to this cry and surrender, trust, pray, and go? I will. If I could invite our worship team back up, we're going to respond through song. Everything's fine at the back. He's okay. If you would all like to stand on your feet. I do wonder how many of us will just, will just pray a prayer this morning or how many of us will sincerely, sincerely call out to God to use us, to change us, to transform us and use us to see this nation and these churches around us and these people in our town and the children in our own homes change for Christ, power, love, and truth. That's what you can have if you believe and receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing. Halfway through this song, I'm going to walk back up and I'm going to ask people to come to the front who want prayer to receive more of the Holy Spirit because we need him. But the first half of this song, I want you to do some own work in your own heart. Open it up to God. Prepare it to receive him. Let's not be like every other church that's struggling. Let's be a church on fire that Christ may be glorified. Let's turn from our sins, pray, humble ourselves, and see God heal this land. Amen. Well, let's sing, and then I'll be back up.